This is 106.7 Wilmington's Big Talker, and my name is Paul Vallone. I would like to welcome you to Guns, Politics, and Freedom, where each Sunday at 5 p.m., as part of the Sunday Night Political Power Block, we give you the ammunition to better defend your gun rights. In case you aren't familiar with me, I direct Grassroots North Carolina since 1994, our state's most effective gun rights organization. As its director, I was involved in drafting and passing our original concealed handgun law. Since then, GRNC has gone on to engineer passage of concealed handgun reciprocity, our purchase permit bypass, Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, the expansion of concealed carry to state and municipal parks, restaurants, public assemblies, educational properties, and much more. Grassroots North Carolina is exactly what the name implies, a grassroots collection of people from all walks of life, who share a common concern that our constitutionally guaranteed freedoms are being eroded. Check us out at grnc.org. That's grnc.org. Now, as I prepare this show, television news is filled with images of Houston and other parts of Texas covered with what has best uh, been described as a flood of biblical proportions as a result of Hurricane Harvey. As I speak, the uh, National Oceanographic uh, administration is tracking what is now being called Hurricane Irma. In Houston, as in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and elsewhere, looting will likely follow as floodwaters recede. Homeowners will be ravaged not only by the storm, but also by thugs and looters. And as uh, discovered by the good people of Charlottesville last month and Charlotte last September, America is suffering an increasing propensity not only for natural disasters, but also rioting with its attendant looting, destruction of property, and death. Now, this episode of Guns, Politics, and Freedom will cover what you, as a gun owner, can legally do to protect your family and your property during declared states of emergency. As you probably know, it's legal to use deadly force in self-defense if you or your family face a reasonable threat of imminent death or great bodily harm. And obviously, it's legal to keep firearms for self-defense in your home. But can authorities legally confiscate your firearms during an emergency, as they did in New Orleans after Katrina? What about using deadly force to defend property? More importantly, what happens if you're forced to evacuate? Can you carry firearms to protect your family if you're forced out of your home? Actually, for North Carolina residents, until fairly recently, the answer to that last question was no. But as I will discuss shortly, a lawsuit filed by Grassroots North Carolina and the Second Amendment Foundation, as well as individual plaintiffs, has considerably improved your ability to carry firearms for self-protection during declared states of emergency in North Carolina. So essentially, we're going to look at three questions. First, what can you legally do to protect your family and your home against looters and other criminals during states of emergency? Second, what restrictions, if any, do you have on carrying firearms outside the home during declared states of emergency? And finally, what protections, if any, do you have against local authorities who decide to seize weapons during emergencies such as uh, New Orleans did uh, during Katrina? Later in the show, we will have as our guest Alan Gottlieb, the Executive Director of Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms and also the Second Amendment Foundation. SAF has taken a leading role in litigating against cities to expand your right to keep and bear arms, including two lawsuits directed uh, directly to our topic. First of all, a disclaimer. Namely, I am not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. Although I have been involved in drafting the legislation we're about to discuss, and although our organization was a plaintiff in litigation which ended up changing the law, I'm not a lawyer, and none of what you are about to hear should be construed to be legal advice. Essentially, in North Carolina until 2012, you were prohibited from carrying a fire, firearm outside the home during a declared state of emergency. Essentially, the ban resulted from a statute prohibiting dangerous substances such as gasoline, uh, but also including firearms and ammunition. Now, that 
prohibition probably resulted from civil rights riots in the 1960s, but nothing in the statute differentiated between civil insurrection and natural disasters. So, the first big wrinkle in the law came to our attention in about February of 2010 when the town of King, North Carolina and Stokes County declared a state of emergency in advance of a pending snowstorm. Yes, I said snowstorm. And then proceeded to post signs prohibiting guns throughout the town. Yes, they pro posted the town against firearms in advance of a snowstorm. You heard it right. So began our focus on the state of emergency gun ban. Interestingly, in early spring of 2010, I was contacted by Alan Gura, the lead counsel in both D.C. versus Heller and McDonald versus Chicago, who was also a friend after defending GRNC in an earlier lawsuit. This was more than a month before the Supreme Court rendered its verdict upholding the Second Amendment as a restriction applying not only to the federal government, but also the states in the case that was uh, McDonald versus Chicago. Essentially, Allen pointed out that both Heller and McDonald uh, had affirmed an individual right to keep arms in the home, but not to bear arms outside the home. Our blanket ban on guns outside the home during states of emergency, he explained, would be the perfect case to get the Supreme Court to affirm the right to carry arms. Gura would build the case, the Second Amendment Foundation would provide the necessary funding, and our organization, GRNC, would recruit plaintiffs and, believe it or not, run legislative interference to ensure the NRA, yes, the NRA, would not screw up the case. More about that shortly. Happily, on September 1, 2010, just two weeks after the suit was filed against Governor Beverly Perdue as Bateman versus Purdue, the governor was kind enough to issue a statewide state of emergency in advance of Hurricane Earl. That was Executive Order 62. Blithely unaware that she was doing so on the opening day of dove season, making criminals out of thousands of dove hunters. Now, in response to GRNC alerts on the issue, uh, Purdue attempted to I guess, clarify her executive order to permit lawful use of firearms and alcohol. The little problem with that, however, was that nothing in North Carolina statutes gave her the power to enact only part of the state of emergency law, rendering her clarification meaningless. So in September of 2010, thousands of gun owners became criminals when Bev Perdue declared a state of emergency. Eventually, our case, Bateman versus Purdue, on March 31st of 2011, uh, Judge Malcolm Howard in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina ruled North Carolina's state of emergency gun ban to be unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment Foundation and GRNC, Grassroots North Carolina, had won thanks to the case constructed by Alan Gura and the present state of emergency law we had in North Carolina was declared unconstitutional. Unfortunately, however, the state chose not to appeal their loss, meaning Bateman versus Purdue never went to the United States Supreme Court to become precedent-setting law for the Second Amendment. In fact, to this day, the High Court has not yet dealt with a case on bearing arms outside the home, and most recently rejected the case, Peruta, uh, the Peruta case, rather, from California. So, essentially, that left North Carolina with an unconstitutional state of emergency gun ban that had to be repealed. Should be pretty straightforward, one would think, to repeal the law, since, of course, Republicans controlled both chambers of the General Assembly. However, those Republicans made that repeal anything but easy, and actually it turned out to be a very large battle in order to get uh, the Republican leadership to actually repeal the state of emergency gun ban instead of merely replacing it with an equally unconstitutional gun ban. Now, we're going to talk about that 
in just a few more moments. Meanwhile, we're going to take a break. You have been listening to Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com, and I am Paul Valone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We're going to take a short break, after which we will return with our discussion of what you can do to defend your home and family during a disaster such as Hurricane Harvey. Join us after the break as we resume Guns, Politics, and Freedom. My name is Paul Valone, and you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7 WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Today, we are talking about what you can do to defend your home and your family during a disaster such as Hurricane Harvey. Now, in North Carolina, as we discussed in the last segment, until 2010, you were prohibited by law from carrying firearms outside your home or ammunition during a declared state of emergency, essentially disarming you at exactly the point you needed it most to defend yourself against looters and other criminals. Fortunately, um, we had two cases which drew attention to this particular problem. One was the uh, Stokes County, when they declared a state of emergency in advance of a pending snowstorm and then posted the entire town against firearms on that premise. And the other, when uh, Governor Beverly Perdue declared a state of emergency uh, in advance of Hurricane Earl on the opening day of dove season, making criminals out of thousands of dove hunters. So the Second Amendment Foundation, Grassroots North Carolina, Uh, and other plaintiffs filed a lawsuit which became Bateman versus Purdue and essentially sued to, I guess, overturn the state of emergency gun ban on Second Amendment grounds. Uh, The good news was that we won the lawsuit and it was overturned as an unconstitutional infringement of your Second Amendment rights However, because the, ch- the state chose not to appeal its loss, um, the case never went to the Supreme Court to become precedent-setting law. And in fact, the bearing arms outside the home issue continues to be unaddressed by the Supreme Court to this day. So essentially, um, we at this point were left with a now unconstitutional ban on carrying firearms outside the home during declared states of emergency because the state didn't, uh, I guess, appeal the loss. It was still, the law was still on the books, but was now uh, largely unenforceable. So we went to the General Assembly to repeal that law. Despite Republican leadership, they made that repeal anything but easy. And in fact, um, when the General Assembly convened in 2012, Um, they gave us quite a bit of trouble in getting this law repealed. Uh, Leadership, in fact, delegated the project to Senator Pete Brunstetter, who was intent on replacing the unconstitutional gun ban with yet another unconstitutional gun ban, one which, by the way, would have continued barring you from carrying firearms outside the home for self-protection. To that end, Senator Brunstetter and the North Carolina Senate eventually capitulated to GRNC's demands and ultimately repealed um, what was then uh, General Statute 14-288.7, the prohibition on carrying uh, firearms as part of dangerous goods outside the home during declared states of emergency. So on October 1st, 2012, it became legal to carry firearms for... My name is Paul Valone, and you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. 
For the next two segments, we have as our honored guest, Alan Gottlieb, Executive Director of the Second Amendment Foundation and Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, uh, to discuss his efforts to improve how you and your family can defend uh, yourself and your family and your property during natural disasters and civil unrest. Welcome, Alan. Hey, it's great to be with you, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, believe me, it is our pleasure. Now, first of all, I'm sure that uh, many of our listeners have heard of the D.C. versus Heller and McDonald versus Chicago decisions, but not necessarily much about how those Supreme Court decisions came to be. Let's talk a little bit in general about what the Second Amendment Foundation has been doing to expand the Supreme Court interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, and, the, and the individual right to keep and bear arms. Well, you started at the right point with the with the uh, Heller decision, which our attorney Alan Gura uh, had litigated that case, and the foundation had a very important amicus brief filed in it as well. And then the McDonald decision uh, that that we had filed that Alan Gura argued also. Those cases basically established at the Supreme Court that they codified that the Second Amendment is in fact an individual right. But in the Heller case, it only applied to uh, federal enclaves or the federal government, since D.C. is not a state. So the McDonald decision then took that and incorporated it through the 14th Amendment, making it applicable to all 50 states uh, and, and all the cities, you know, political subdivisions, so that your federal right couldn't be taken away from you by, you know, various state and local governments. Uh, and it was interesting that we filed that McDonald case the day the Heller decision came down. And the day the uh, McDonald decision came down, we filed a very important case in your home state of North Carolina, Bateman versus Purdue. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, you did. And and yes, we appreciate it very much. (laughs) Continue, please. Well, Bateman versus Purdue was filed basically because North Carolina had this law, which a number of other states at the time had on their books as well, that said that during times of emergencies like snowstorms or hurricanes, the state could suspend Second Amendment rights, basically, and say to you that you couldn't buy a gun or ammunition or you couldn't take your gun out of your home to to use it to defend yourself or protect your property. And uh, so we filed that suit in federal court, and, of course, we won. Uh, And North Carolina, being smarter than some of the other states we sue, decided not to appeal the case. So it ended with with just at a federal court level. It didn't go to the appeals court level or give us a chance to take that one to the U.S. Supreme Court, which we would have liked to have done, quite frankly. But North Carolina was smart, and they said, yes, you're right, and we're not going to appeal the case. Uh, And, of course, that makes sure that like what just happened now in in Texas or in the past, like in in Louisiana and New Orleans when they did confiscate guns, that that couldn't happen to people in North Carolina. So we've helped protect the Second Amendment rights of, of, of residents and citizens in your state. Yes and no, because we really don't specifically have a statute here that prevents actually confiscating firearms. Um, you ended up, and I guess we'll talk more about this in, in a couple of minutes, but you ended up actually, or, or uh, did not Louisiana end up passing a statute that specifically prohibits confiscating guns during state emergency? They did, uh, but again, uh, it, you know, when you already have a court order in place, it sort of in some ways serves the purpose to some extent. What happened in New Orleans was is they did flat out confiscate people's firearms. We went to federal court and got a preliminary injunction stopping it from happening, and then we litigated the case and found New Orleans you know, violated the constitutional rights of those people and had a permanent injunction in place so that New Orleans could no, could no longer ever confiscate people's guns during an emergency. The legislature then responding to the court action passed the law statewide so that it's codified in the state law. But once you already have one court decision like that, if, if an annual locality tried to do it, you'd obviously go to court against them, win, and they'd be liable for substantial damages. All right. Uh, it wasn't quite that easy, as I recall, to win New Orleans. Uh, I was just reading some of your uh, releases on this thing. That was kind of a long and drawn-out process. Uh, as I recall, it was, ex- <laughs> it was extremely long ago now because the city of New Orleans, under control of anti-gun Democrats, quite honestly, were refusing to comply with anything and and in fact uh, lied to the court about what they did or didn't do, wouldn't provide information. It turned out that the city attorney was held in contempt of court, as a matter of fact, uh, for, for, not, know that. For, for not for not litigating properly. Uh, and the city then, of <laughs> course, didn't want to return the firearms uh, easily. They put it roadblocks in place, uh, 
so that you had to prove it was your firearm, even though you took it out of your house and tagged it where it came from. You had to prove that you owned it. And of course, most people you know, you had had guns for years. You don't have your bill. Of, they want your bill of sale. Well, you know, who keeps the bill of sale to a farm that you may have bought 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even two years ago? And so what happened is we then had to go back to court and litigate to force the city of New Orleans to actually release those guns to people. Unfortunately, but they stored them in a container outside, you know, in, 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 in water and everything. And by the time we got a lot of those guns back to people, they were rusted, corroded, destroyed. Uh, and then we had to have the city give restitution and damage to many people as well. It was, it was just horrible the way New Orleans dealt with that. They did not litigate in good faith whatsoever. They did not want to comply with the court orders. Um, and again, there's an attorney got held in contempt of court for it. That's uh, that's astounding. Actually, I find it astounding that, in particularly in a case where, and I think, or I guess, um, and I realize it's still somewhat early in Hurricane Harvey, but I don't think we're seeing the same level of looting that we saw during Hurricane Katrina, are we? Or is it just my impression? I know on the 16th, they uh, somebody shot the first looter in in uh, Hurricane Harvey in Texas, and I know that Texas law does allow for use of deadly force in protecting property. So, uh, what's your impression? Did you get that same impression? Basically, yes, Paul. Uh, we have not gotten very many complaints of uh, you know uh, people having used their firearms to stop looters. The reports on the news show that the looting seems to be less than it was in, in New Orleans. Uh, but again, quite frankly, probably in Texas, you have that law protecting people to you know, allow us to protect their property. And you probably have more goods per capita in, 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 in Texas than you had in New Orleans as well. Uh, and as a result, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's panning out well. The good thing is, the good news is we've had no complaints of anybody having their guns or firearms confiscated in the state of Texas like we did in New Orleans. Yeah, I think that's probably considerably less likely in in Texas. Call it a guess, but uh, this, I guess, is is yet another example. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, Doctor uh, Lot will will begin to work on this, his Crime Prevention Research Center, because this seems like yet another case of more guns, less crime. Uh, the Texans are better armed. They've got better uh, statutes which prohibit or which allow rather the use of deadly force to protect themselves. And consequently, we're seeing a much lower rate of looting than we saw in New Orleans, wouldn't it seem? Oh, yeah. But what's interesting is we're not seeing that being reported by the national news media because it doesn't fit their narrative with gun control. Oh, I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> um, uh, what I am was particularly shocked uh, with that the local authorities would actually go house to house to seize firearms. How did all that work, by the way? Did they just, did the police just show up at people's doors and say, uh, give us your guns? Well, it was, the police would come to check to see if people were still in their homes. And if you were, they'd then ask you if you had a firearm. And if you said yes, they, they, they demand that you give it to them. And of course, the big news story that was CNN did do a story of a, they were there with the police officers of an old woman who didn't want to leave her house. They wanted her gun, and she said, no, I needed to protect myself from looters. And they had a fight with her to basically physically take it out of her hands uh, to get it out of the house. And, you know, uh, and she was sort of manhandled in the process. And, uh, you know, she and other people became our plaintiffs in this case. And it was, uh, it was just horrible to watch. And it was, you know, total... Uh, violation of multiple laws, and, and not only just not just constitutional rights, the way it was done. And uh, while like groups like the ACLU condemned how it was done, they didn't want to get involved in, in protecting people's rights. Once again, I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you, because uh, once again, I see that the uh, ACLU is refusing to get involved in people's rights, as some of the conservative groups are uh, involved in some of the demonstrations, such as Charlottesville. And now the ACLU says, says they're going to back off from defending some of these people. Um, I guess uh, <clears throat> their idea of constitutional freedoms and our idea of constitutional freedoms seem to vary somehow. Well, there's no doubt when it comes to firearms and Second Amendment rights, the ACLU is not consistent with defending the Bill of Rights. Um, yeah, that would be an understatement, uh, <laughs> almost non-existent. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do here. We're going to take a little break, and uh, we'll come back. And then I want to hear a little bit about more about what Second Amendment Foundation uh, is doing uh, to defend, uh, actually to expand the interpretation of the Supreme Court on individual rights and how people can help. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, you have been listening to Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. And uh, I am Paul Vallone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We're going to take a short break. When we will return with our guest, Alan Gottlieb, Executive Director of the Second Amendment Foundation, uh, to discuss his efforts on how in improving your effort to defend your family and your home during natural disasters and civil rest, unrest, and just in general, for that matter. So join us after the break for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. My name is Paul Vallone, and you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker uh, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. And we have as our guest Alan Gottlieb, Executive Director of the Second Amendment Foundation and Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, to discuss uh, their efforts now in this segment uh, on getting the Supreme Court to expand their interpretation of the individual right to keep and bear arms. Welcome back, Alan. Good to be back with you. So we had uh, we were supposed to be here in North Carolina, case number three for uh, for Mr. Gura, Alan Gura, and arguing to the Supreme Court, uh, and in th- that case, expanding the right, uh, the interpretation to include bearing arms outside home. And that case was Bateman versus Purdue, but unfortunately, you can tell them we won at the trial court level, and North Carolina wouldn't appeal it, so we couldn't get it to get to the U.S. Supreme That's Court. That's hard to say. Unfortunately, we won. That's really hard to say. But it was... <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, it, it it is. But we would have liked to have a national precedent, uh, even, even though the court gets cited, but the case gets cited, by the way, in in federal courts all across the country anyway. But it would have been nice to have the Supreme Court put the stamp on it that your Second Amendment rights don't stop at your front door. Got it. All right. So that one didn't become precedent setting law and second amendment foundation and Alan Gura, you guys have been working since then on other cases to establish that precedent. How's that going? Well, it's been a rough haul so far, Paul. Uh, we've had a number of cases that we petitioned for cert to the U S Supreme court and they've cho- you know, very few cases get to the court. They have a very large, large amount of uh, competition to be able to get on their short calendars. And so, so far, we haven't been able to get a, a third case to them. But we're working on it very diligently right now. As you're aware, we have a case in Washington, D.C. against D.C. again, Ren versus D.C., which is on right to carry. Uh, because in D.C., uh, we knocked out their ban on carry with another case known as Palmer. Uh, and they uh, took it to the appeals court where we won. But then they, quote, unquote, wouldn't appeal to the Supreme Court. So we couldn't get there with it. And then now the Ren case here. We we won at the appeals court level, and the city of D.C. Uh, is trying to uh, have the uh, court here in Bonk at the appeals court level. But eventually, we hope this one will end up at the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will be able to argue that you have a right to carry, you know, the right to keep and bear, bear meaning carry, uh, means something, and you have, can have a firearm outside your own home for self protection, uh, and, and put it flat out out there, out there and, you know, as a this U.S. Supreme Court decision. So we've got that case percolating right now. And then uh, last week or so, we filed an amicus brief in a case coming out of Maryland known as Colby that uh, uh, Maryland has banned so-called assault weapons. And their their the definition is extremely broad to the point that virtually every semi-automatic handgun uh, in the state is banned, and particularly the guns, the handguns used by uh, the state patrol are technically banned oh, under really? the law in Maryland. <laughs> and so we filed an amicus brief uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court for them to uh, grant cert to hear that case. I'm so sure the state of Maryland is, is enforcing that to the letter of the law and making sure that their own state police can't carry these firearms, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, okay, kind of so like rate, uh, when 